I thought we'd do a meditation on verse two and um, just kind of unpack that a little bit more experientially because I think um, I think you get the premise, you get the concept. It, now it's a question of how do you marry that with your own experience and with your own process. So, um, so I'll put it on the screen just so you don't lose it. But if you wanna have your um, eyes closed or eyes just mostly closed, that's totally fine. It's just up there as a prompt. So we'll do meditation now. And so get yourself a nice posture. <clears throat> Main thing being straight up and down and um, trying not to rely on the back of the chair or the back of a wall, um, unless you have health problems and need extra support. And just try to feel very present in your body. Remembering some of the ideas we talked about before, that despite this body not being maybe exactly the way we would want it to be, it actually is perfect in terms of the spiritual path. There are not so many obstacles that it prevents us from learning and processing. And we have access and connection to teachings and community And so in this perfect human rebirth, we want to develop our path even further. And so think to ourselves, the purpose of my life is to understand and free all sentient beings from suffering, understand and bring all sentient beings to happiness. In order to do that, I need to understand the cause and effect within myself and be able to achieve that for myself. And while I can help sentient beings all the way along the way of my own path's development, it's only as a Buddha that I'll be able to help in an unmistaken way. Not an educated guess, but a real clairvoyance or omniscience even. And so to develop this mind to its utmost extent, for the benefit of all sentient beings, I'm going to do this meditation. <clears throat> and with that strong motivation, now we'll shift to the breath, allowing surface distractions to settle. And just the breath, not judging or controlling your breath, just using it as a very gentle focal object.
And as different thoughts and emotions arise in your mind, there is no need to push them away or disassociate from them or cling and try and examine them. Just let them be without interference, but also without interest. Give your full attention to the breath and decide that the thoughts are not interesting right now. Just, dev just very gently shifting your emphasis. You breathe in and you know that you're breathing in. And you breathe out and you know that you're breathing out. And you just be with that knowing. Keeping your focus balanced, not too tight, not too loose. And now very gently shift to analysis and think of the verse as a whole and contemplate the meaning. The practice of all the bodhisattvas is to leave behind one's homeland where our attachment to family and friends overwhelms us like a torrent while our aversion toward enemies and rages inside us like a blazing fire and delusion's darkness obscures what must be adopted and abandoned. Just come to your immediate impressions of that verse. What strikes a chord with you? What has the ring of truth? And just repeat your first impressions to yourself. And then we take it line by line. The practice of all the bodhisattvas is to leave behind one's homeland. Our homeland refers to our most familiar mental states, the three poisons, anger, attachment, ignorance. When things don't go how we want, 
we default and go automatically to one of these states or cycle through these states. Just considering if that's true or not. Asking is my main reaction when I don't get what I want, one of these three poisons. And then maybe occasionally I respond with patience or kindness, with equanimity, with wisdom, but just in an everyday sort of way, I often retreat to my homeland, these three poisons. How often is that true for ourselves as an individual? And of those three, which one is dominant? Which one is most common for me? And there's no need to rate them as better or worse. They're all problematic and lead to one another. But just as an exercise of self-knowing, is your style more angry, attached, or ignorant? And it might seem too coarse to label your habits as anger, attachment, and ignorance. So look at their lighter versions, their less escalated versions. Are you more likely to get irritable, needy, or vague? And just know that, and then look at all of the versions, starting with attachment. And so our attachment to family and friends overwhelms us like a torrent. What does that feel like it means experientially? What is our attachment to family and friends? 
our expectation of them? Have we decided that they are the cause for our happiness when actually they are just a condition? Is our mind filled with hopes and fears about their lives and our relationship? Waves of need, waves of grief, And so the practice of all bodhisattvas is to leave behind attachment, not to leave behind family and friends, but to leave our attachment to them, to allow our love to become bigger than our attachment so that we genuinely wish them happiness without expectations of success, without pressure, without it needing to look the way we think it should look, without feeling like we're the one to do everything. A love that is open-ended and expansive, wanting their highest happiness, which is the actualization of their fullest potential. using the styles and tools that suit them. A love that is not attachment. Attachment might want them to have happiness so that they give us happiness, like a business deal. And so just thinking, if I would like to be a bodhisattva, it's attachment, one of the huge things that prevents it. Just examining the role of attachment in your life and the obstacles it's created. Does it ever overwhelm us like a torrent? And now shift to looking at your relationship with aversion and anger. While our aversion toward enemies rages inside us like a blazing fire. Try and experientially touch the way in which that happens in life. When there's people that irritate you or annoy you. People you're afraid of or find challenging those who have hurt you or hurt someone you love or hurt those who are vulnerable. Maybe you name them enemies. Maybe you wouldn't label them that, but people that you have strong aversion towards that escalates into a rage or anger, burning like a fire. Just identifying the way in which that happens. Just like attachment, anger exaggerates. It sees the bad or the negative or the harmful. 
but then it exaggerates how much of the person that is or how significant it is or how permanent it is. And emotions and analysis rage inside of us, trying to fix it or end it or soothe it. Very rarely do we turn and look at anger itself and see the way in which it is not justified, not useful, doesn't create sustainable solutions. Even though, of course, it's very natural, it is not necessary. So just spend a few minutes looking at your relationship with anger and the way it rages like a blazing fire within us at times. The practice of a bodhisattva is to leave behind one's homeland, the homeland of anger and aversion. This doesn't mean we pretend that we don't have enemies or we pretend that we don't have people whose behavior we find challenging or harmful. What it means is we leave behind the wish to harm, the wish to dominate and retaliate and win. This is the practice of a bodhisattva. And delusion's darkness obscures what must be adopted and abandoned. Thinking, what is my own personal relationship with delusion ignorance? That confusion that isn't sure what to do or what not to do. And so becomes maybe paralyzed with being overwhelmed. Or becomes very, very busy doing anything except what needs to be done. But just look at the role of ignorance, delusion in your life. What is your relationship with it?
And so just conclude that the real problem is delusion. It's what makes us so confused about what to adopt and what to abandon. It's what fuels our attachment and our aversion. It's what keeps us in this homeland of the three poisons and so far has prevented our practice of a bodhisattva. and dedicate all of the energy you put into this analysis to achieving complete enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. And you can relax your attention. Okay. So, any any impressions that you feel comfortable sharing? Yeah, this is this is Heather. I'll have to change my name from Anthony to Heather at some point here. But um, when I what came up for me was really unexpected. About almost exactly a year ago, I was preparing to move to Italy. I had an apartment and the the whole nine, and then then all these things happened in the world, and that didn't happen. And you know, as you were talking about leaving, as you were reading that leaving the homeland, you know, it just sort of occurred to me in this, while I was meditating, I got it kind of upside down, but how much of that was sort of this like escapism. A lot of it was animated by get me out of here. And, you know, even though I love Italy, blah, blah, blah. But, but how, you know, as you sort of work through the, the meditation, that I don't think of myself as really avoiding much. I think of myself as just sort of naturally confronting, but it's actually kind of this, I don't like it, I go berserk. And, you know, and then, um, so maybe what I should do is go be somewhere where I don't understand what anybody's saying <laughs> better. And you, know, like you can't get offended if you don't know what they're saying. <laughs> it's pretty, there's a beach, but it's like, I, it's like all of them kind of wrapped up in, in one that I hadn't really, I don't know how, exactly how it happened and it's still very pixelated, but that's what came up for me in a way that was new when you were going through that. Yeah, there it's, it's provocative word choices. So even if it doesn't come to the pith of the verse, it kind of awakens something that, that's really useful self-awareness, I think. Yeah, let's see, there was one in the chat. Um, I have a greater understanding regarding the three poisons and how to unpack them. I just have more clarity and I can't thank you enough. Yeah, you're very welcome. Those three poisons, they're the stinkers, um, <laughs> you know, and especially if you identify them without identifying with them, you know, to see they arise within my mind out of habit and many conditions just like they do for everyone else. I'm not bad because of them. It's not like a fatal flaw. It's not original sin. It's just the natural result of a confused mind. And it's a confusion that can be ended. But lots of things happened before I came to understand that. And I made a lot of mistakes and hurt myself and others. And I need to take responsibility for that, but I'm not bad because of it. I'm not at fault because of it. And so just kind of making that distinction, then you can think these three poisons are the enemy. I am not the enemy, you know, they are the enemy and they are like poisons. They're, that's, they're what's making me sick, which also gives you the good sense of them being additional and removable, if that makes sense. So you can have kind of quite, strong kind of attitudes about getting rid of them without feeling like you're cutting out a piece of yourself. You know, who am I without my anger? Who am I without my attachment? Well, happier <laughs> and nicer. <laughs> That's who you are. It's the same you, just a happier, nicer one, you know, to put it, I guess, over simplistically. But yeah, it's uh, when you when you hear the words give up your homeland, there's so many directions to go with it. You know, I think, um, Americans or people from the United States are maybe less likely to travel abroad than a lot of people in other countries. But if you have traveled a little bit, 
it is, it's nice, even if you've gone to a different state or a different town, to notice the traveler's mind that has different expectations, maybe less expectations of people, and because of that, enjoys them more. You know, how easy it is to make friends when you're traveling, how hard it is to make friends when you live in the same town. You know, like how many new friends have you made in your hometown, <laughs> you know, but you travel and you're like friends with the barista and you're friends with the guy at the gas station and you're, you know, quite quickly connecting and relating to people because you have less pressure on the relationship. And if there's confusion or there's disagreement, it's much easier to just let it go. I'm like, oh, we just didn't understand each other. Anyway, you know, the traveler's mindset. So having a sense of giving up your homeland also can have that lovely traveler's mindset. It has to feel voluntary. You know, if you're forced from your homeland, then you, there's a different kind of connotation to the whole deal. But I think it can be very useful to remember what it's been like when you've not been with your same old people and your same old job and your same old lifestyle and whatever, when you've shifted gears, who are you in a whole different context? And are you a bit freer? Um, because that's a possibility accessible to us always, but uh, we forget. Yeah. Were you able to kind of pinpoint your default poison, kind of what your go-to one was, or did they all seem kind of similarly <laughs> present? Depends on the decade. No. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. <laughs> oh, anger from Corey, yep. <laughs> yeah, Jackie? I was just gonna make a, a comment that you know, one wonders if how I see myself, my particular primary delusion is the same thing that those around me would pinpoint. It'd be interesting to have that exercise where you secretly, yeah. you know. <laughs> It could be embarrassing, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's a good point, I wonder, I wonder. Especially, you know, depending on how we've been socialized, you know, because of course, um, for men, it's more acceptable to express anger and less acceptable to express attachment. And for women, it's more acceptable to express attachment and less acceptable to express anger, you know, um, is some of it conditioned, you know, kind of societal responses as opposed to what you're actually feeling and et cetera, et cetera, and all of that plays into it too. So you're secretly angry, but you're showing the aspect of attachment because that's allowed, anger is not allowed, <laughs> you know, or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's all worth unpacking because the thing is, is that as soon as you know a pattern in yourself, it doesn't mean you'll stop doing it. It just means that you'll have more of a sense of humor about it and it'll dissolve quicker. You know, if you know yourself well, it's harder to be offended. You know, in, um, in Israel, sometimes they say that I use words that are too big for people whose second language is English. And I know that I do that and I'm working on it, but I still do it and I'm trying to catch myself. But when they say that, sometimes they're really mad at me. They're like, we want to understand what we're saying, but you're using weird terms and it's annoying us. Could you stop it? And because I know that's my way, it's, it's sort of like amusing. And I'm like, oh no, I did it again. I'm so sorry, you guys. Whereas if I was really hung on to it, but with kind of self-deception that was justifying it or blah, 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 then I'd be really defensive and need to excuse, well, I do it because that's the way it should be said. You know, <laughs> I could get kind of, you know, hair toss, you know, defensive about it. But things that you've made some peace with, even if you still do them, that, you know, it's kind of taken the stinger off. And when you do it, it's much easier for you to catch yourself and stop and let it dissolve without needing to make excuses for yourself, without needing to self-soothe, without justification. You just do, oh, whoops, and then you stop. Or someone calls you on it and it's like, oh, you're right, sorry. It's not a, such a drama as the things that you haven't made peace with about yourself. And it's, it's that paradox thing of as soon as you say, that's just how I am and I do that, then it opens up the space for you to change. But if you think I have to change, I have to change, then you just get stuck that way. Do you know that, that weirdness? Yeah, so self-knowledge is really the key to all the transformation. 
and you go, okay, so my guy's anger. All right, so let's let's watch and see how that's operated in my daily life and caused a bunch of trouble without a punishing attitude. Just, oh, yep. Oh, it plays out there too. Oh, it plays out there too. Wow, that has stolen a lot of my peace of mind, you know? And it just slowly interrupts the momentum, so yeah. Let's see. Oh, comment section says, as far as family is concerned, attachment is daunting. It almost feels like you can't let go because then you would be all alone in this world without understanding from family. How does one let go of these attachments? Well, it's a very good question and it's all of our question for sure. And um, I think you really need to look at the distinction between love and attachment because they are different, but look the same until they're challenged. So if your loved one does something harmful and unexpected and you're in a place of love, you say, oh, it's wrong, right? If your loved one does the very same thing, but your mind is really driven by attachment, you say, what's wrong with you, <laughs> right? Whether you say it in those words or not, that's the energy. So when it's love, you're like, oh, something must be wrong because you're not behaving according to your core values or the things you find important or whatever, whatever. You must be suffering. And because I love you, I wanna understand that suffering and see if we can work through it together. Attachment says, you're not doing what I like you to do and that pisses me off. You live to entertain me <laughs> or support me or validate me. What about me? You're not doing the thing I like. I like it when you're happy because you're more fun that way. Not, I like it when you're happy because I love you and I want you to be happy. <laughs> so when you're unpacking stuff with family members, it's so challenging and I'm right there with you because you know I haven't lived at home for 20 years and now I'm stranded in Montana and I live with my folks and they barely know me as an adult. I left for Australia when I was like 19, you know, so they're like, who are you? And I'm like, who are you? And you know, there's all the baggage from childhood and whatever and we're, we're trying to work it through. But a lot of working that through is understanding that we, all of us have an assumption about the role the other is supposed to play in our happiness. And if we can, as individuals, let go of the attachment to them giving us happiness, then everybody's free to live their life and be who they are. And the, ex the lack of expectation means you've got more space for love. Yeah. So what you're trying to do in every single relationship you have is change the percentages. Less percentage attachment, more percentage love. Yeah, and not think you can like purify it and make it all perfectly love and no attachment, but just gently change the percentages so it's a lot more love and a lot less attachment. And that also frees you up from need. It doesn't make you alone, actually. What it means is that more aspects of them are safe to be with you. It's not like you can only handle you when you're in that sort of a way. You know, do you think about that with some of your relatives? I can only be with you when you're like this, but when you're like that, I just can't be with you. <laughs> you know? And it might be that physically you maintain those boundaries that when they're, you know, whatever, you don't want to be around them because it's not healthy or useful. But internally, you don't have that same agitation and panic of, oh, just get away from me. You're just like, eh, it's not healthy if we're together when you're like that. So I'm just going to move over here till you settle down. Do, do, do. It's a lot more relaxed. So if you can look at how much attachment disempowers your joy because you've given them the power to give or take your joy when you're operating from attachment. Love is not giving them the power. Yeah, yeah, big sigh for sure. Yeah, and we're, you know, we're all with you. Like you forget and then you fall into the same old patterns and you know, it happens again and again, but you can gradually break the circuit if you just catch yourself even if you don't change anything, if you can watch yourself make the same mistake, rather than making the same mistake without watching yourself, it does start to interrupt the momentum. And then later when you're by yourself, you say, oh, I visited grandma when I was hungry and I expected her to feed me as soon as I got there. Next time I'm gonna have a snack first and then go visit her and I won't come with all this neediness of grandma feed me or whatever, you know whatever it is, you know, you're taking care of yourself so that you're not putting all your stuff on them the second you connect. 
that makes sense. Whatever version of that, you know, makes sense in your own dynamic. Yeah. And then what about enemies? <laughs> or what about people that drive you crazy who you find irritable and how much mental space is taken up by just trying to figure out what you can say or do to get them to change <laughs> rather than what you can say or do to yourself to get yourself not to be reactive. That's the thing. Because again, you've given them all the power to take your peace. Yeah, they not maybe didn't even want that power. Some people do. Some people are really jerks that way. But lots of people don't even want the power to take your happiness. And you gave it to them anyway. Yeah, so yeah, keep coming back to there are conditions and there are causes. The substantial cause of your experience is your own mind. Everything else around you is a condition. It certainly is, and sometimes a very powerful one, but it's never the exact cause of your experience. And that everything exists within a context. So what you think is impossible or terrible is only because of your framework of what is hard. If your framework of hard was bigger and more expansive and included kind of a, a, an idea of history and realms, then this little thing that happened to you would kind of shrink to its accurate proportion and wouldn't trouble you as much, you know? It's hard because in the moment, you know, things happening feel like they're happening to you, but things are just happening, you know? Um, there's one teacher who always says, don't take your life so personally, <laughs> you know? 